Well, on the uh, board, and it will stay there for much of the time I'm speaking, is the uh, criteria for hubris syndrome that <coughs> Professor Davidson and I put together for the article in Brain in 2009. And not much has changed about that. And I will draw a bit of attention to it. But it's mainly something there for you to read, absorb, and see. One thing I would wish to point out is this table on the right, which tries to show the overlap to narcissistic uh, personality disorder. And those things which we thought were unique to um, hubris syndrome. And overall, we said you shouldn't make the diagnosis unless three of these 14 criteria are there. But that's just really background. I thought I would start with perhaps one of the most charismatic politicians of the 20th century, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Now, I think nobody, denied, or very few, denied, even his opponents. Uh, he was not a consensual figure. He knew how to hate. But he was hubristic in the sense that many politicians are hubristic, or many leaders are hubristic. But I personally don't think he did develop hubris syndrome. Now, it could go many aspects of his career. But one aspect I would draw attention to, he had a cynical sense of humor. And I think that is one of the things that sometimes helps a little bit on the issue of developing hubris. He was a four-term president. He took his country through the depression, the economic depression, and the whole challenge of Pearl Harbor and the Second World War. Uh, the moment when I think that he could, and probably did develop hubris, but not hubris syndrome, was in 1937, when he uh, tabled proposals to move the Supreme Court up from uh, 9 to 15. And he was doing it with a deliberate intention, if he got it through, of packing the Supreme Court, which was putting down a whole raft of reservations and judgments which were effectively neutering and sometimes disabling New Deal provisions, on which, in fairness, he had just won a thumping election in 1936. And if you look at the press and everything, when this was announced, people kept saying, how could he do such a thing? Hubris. Why would he uh, ignore people's advice? Hubris. And uh, that was the, the moment where if he was going to develop it, he would have done. And it's worth remembering the Senate then had 76 Democrats in it, less than 100. It was a smaller Senate. It was overwhelming evidence that this would pass. And yet, less than six months later, it was defeated by Democrats switching in massive ways out of him. Now, I think the important thing to recognize about this man is that in his life, he had people who he encouraged to argue with him, who he wanted them to dissent. And they were given license to dissent. The first toeholder, and a very important one, was Eleanor, his wife. Eleanor was a formidable woman. Many people, uh, in my view, get her wrong. She only really came into her own right as a figure after Roosevelt died, when Truman very wisely appointed her to be the head of the Human Rights Commission. Uh, most of its work was here in London. And she, I think, it's worth remembering one quote about her. Never have I seen naivety and cunning so carefully blended. And I think that she is underestimated. She was a new dealer at times when her husband was often wavering. She was always there in the mind, though very rarely there in the presence. But she was a formidable figure. And of course, another classical case of a woman holding back their uh, husband from becoming a hubristic in the sense of hubris syndrome. I think he's Clementine Churchill, who some of you know in June 1940, wrote a very touching letter on the third attempt and remember, June 1940 was post-Dunkirk, post-Battle of Britain. If ever a time you became hubris, it was probably that one for Churchill. And she spotted this change in his behavior. And she said to him, you know, I, 
you, you're not like you used to be. You used to welcome your ideas, particularly from young people. You would engage with them. Now they know that you just snap at them. They don't even bother to give you this. It's a very important, and I used to say to my wife, why didn't you write these letters to me when I was foreign secretary? <laughs> uh, she said I was telling you to every day. Um, another person, in fact, the person who invented the word toeholder is a very interesting figure called Lewis Howe. He was in uh, Roosevelt's life from 1911. He used to live in his, wherever he was. If he was in Albany as the governor of New York, he'd live, have a room in uh, the mansion in Albany. If he was in the White House, he would live in the White House. He was the only person when he was president, or not the only, but very nearly the only person, certainly of the sort of paid staff who called him Franklin. And he'd say, my God, this is the most stupid idea you've ever had in my life, Franklin, and you cannot do it. And yet he was constantly there, always a, an independent voice, and he died tragically in the spring of 1936. Some people say he would never have tried to pack the Supreme Court if uh, Lewis Howe had still been there. And these people can have a crucial impact after 1936, there was a short gap where there was no obvious replacement for Howe. And then in 38, and all then through the war years, came the figure of Harry Hopkins. Well, I don't know about you, I always thought that Harry Hopkins was a great international expert, a strategic figure who had been brought in by uh, Roosevelt to advise him and fill in a gap in his knowledge on international affairs. Not a bit of it. He was a uh, social worker from the Corn Belt who knew nothing about international politics. What he did know was how to handle uh, Roosevelt. And he had an extraordinarily clever mind and a, a, and a very good mind. Um, and somebody said of him, Judge Rosenham, which I'll come to later, who's another toe holder, he was only one, he, 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 uh, which is, uh, he has only one loyalty in his life, and it was a kind of religion, Franklin D. Roosevelt. And he was utterly, completely loyal to him. And from that basis of loyalty, he could afford to be critical and he could be accepted. And I believe that he had a huge influence. And uh, Marshall said, the great general and then the secretary of state, said nobody can understand or appreciate the influence of Harry Hopkins on Roosevelt. When Roosevelt sent him to see Stalin in uh, 1941, he tells Stalin, treat him as if it was me myself in the room. Say to him anything as if it, I was there. And it was, a, again, an extraordinary relationship, and he could talk, frankly. And he, too, came and lived in the White House. In fact, got married in the White House and brought his wi wife into the, into the White House. And then the um, other one, which I think is absolutely crucial, along with Howe and Eleanor, there right from the start, if you think that the making of Roosevelt was when he had polio and he was in the Canadian island of Campobello, and that was Missy Legrand, always called Missy, and she was an extraordinary influence on, uh, somebody said he was, she was his real wife, is arguable about what their sexual relationship was, but what she was was she was there when Eleanor was not there. She would play poker. She loved cocktails. She would even be with him with his stamp duty uh, collection. But she knew how to say no. She knew how to be frank with him, particularly in private. And Judge Rosenborn said of her, which I think is also um, a pretty good quote, that Missy was the one person who he would always listen to. And I think that is, uh, she was just, you know, no, no, never went to university, didn't have a sort of trained mind in that sort of way, but was an effective and constant companion. And the other one was a person called Judge Rosenham, who was never on the payroll. He was a judge in uh, New York City um, from 1928, a huge influence. He always was aware of the need to stay within the law. And he used him on the phone, and writing, to 
push ideas up against him. And am I going too far, basically? You know, am I stretching the truth? Am I, and that he brought him down to Washington in 1942 and became a presidential advisor. Now, I just want to flag this up. We can have mentors for people who are prone to hubris. You can try to grapple with the hubris syndrome that has developed and pull it back. And I believe mentors have an extremely important role to play. And in fairness, in business, they are used. They're often very private. Uh, arrangements. One arrangement I know was in a company where they were singling out young people to be future chief executives. And in good companies, that process starts 20 years before they might become 20, uh, chief executive. And they would spot sometimes people who they thought had elements of hubris developing. And the mentor they would choose would be an older person who they knew from discussions with them they admired often in the same industry, but not in the same company. And all that was required of this mentor was to take them out to supper or to uh, lunch, twice at the most a year, maybe a bit more often. And they could have a build a relationship, and they could take advice, and particularly caution, and management issues, and how to handle people, and a broader base. It was felt much better than the person's own management. And I think that is another issue that needs to be changed. Now on hubris syndrome, from this list you've seen there, I want to be very clear. This is a very narrow concept. Hubris is a vast concept, as we've heard now, rooted in Greek mythology, spreads across many different aspects. It's part of the spectrum of a lot of uh, behavior and character. Hubris syndrome, as I've tried to define it, is the following. It's First of all, that article said hubris syndrome, uh, a, person, a, a personality disorder, question mark. I would now remove the question mark and I'd remove the word disorder because I don't think it should be associated too much in the mind with illness or disease. I think it is a mental state. So I would call it a, um, a personality change. It's a personality change in people who exercise power. People exercise power at every level in our society. You don't always think of presidents and prime ministers. Uh, the headmistress of a school, a primary school, can exert power. We all encounter them in our life. The public is well aware of this syndrome. I wish sometimes more important decision makers were as aware of it. They're almost, as was said earlier, business schools are remarkably resistant to analyzing hubris syndrome uh, because in a way they themselves, as it was said by one of the things, the, are, are feeding out a hubristic view of leadership. But I do think that what is important to remember also is that we excluded from hubris syndrome anyone with, in the broadest sense, psychiatric illness, but in particular depression and in particular, of course, uh, bipolar. Again, that's a spectrum. Unless you are one-on-one -on -one treating them as a patient, it's very difficult to be sure that there isn't an underlying mania, which might well explain hubris syndrome. So better to rule it out. I mean, for example, President Lyndon Johnson, one of the most hubristic presidents that there's ever been, undoubtedly, although he hid it in all levels, had and diagnosed by Duke University study of US presidents had uh, hubris syndrome. So you've got to be very careful. Where that exists, it's better to leave it and let it not stand as hubris syndrome. And I think then you come to this other aspect of hubris syndrome, which fascinates me. If it is acquired, and let's face it, it's much easier to argue for acquired personality change now after the 25-year-old debate on post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder, the medical profession resisted as laboring as a illness. They didn't think that you could acquire personality changes, going right back to Freud, Jung, Adler, all through a lot of American psychiatry and our own, and it was resisted. Now it is accepted, and I think rightly so, and it makes it easier for people to focus on hubris syndrome. But the other thing is, and fascinates me, is this issue, if power is removed, what happens? If it's acquired, it should uh, phase down, maybe go completely. 
Well, in the small paperback which I wrote about um, Hubris Syndrome in 2007, and that was about Blair and Bush and the Iraq War, I had the advantage of watching Blair twice on exactly the same discussion, four people, wives and ourselves, one in uh, December uh, 1999, and one in the summer of 2002. And the subjects were exactly the same, Iraq, and why, in my case, I didn't believe we should join the Euro, in his case, passionate wish that you should do. And it was therefore we had a bond of comparison. I've never met George W. Bush, and I was nervous about the diagnosis, but I felt, I've read everything in Mora and that and that subject, but I felt the shock of 9-11, and if you see him in that primary school down in Florida, when the news comes, you see it on his face. And quite rightly so. I mean, so, you know, here was Pearl Harbor in New York. And from the moment he knew that the second tower had been shot. And I watched him and I read him. And I thought there was anyhow a change. I think his hubristic phase was by far the greatest in the first uh, four years. And that after he got a second election, uh, it changed, his policies changed. He seemed to be listening to more. He got rid of Rumsfeld. He put Cheney more in his place. He was very much more open to advice. And then when he retired, he retired in the most remarkable way. Didn't seem to want to go on television, very loyal and friendly to Obama, helpful. And Texan friends who knew him well and know him now, which I have also come to know, are absolutely unequivocal about it. We knew George before he became president. He changed in the presidency. He's now back old George again. Now, it's only one case. You've got to be very careful in this whole area where you're looking at people in some depth in drawing too many conclusions from one or two cases. And I'm very, very conscious of that. So we need to be wary on all those scores. Now, the final thing which I would like to talk about in a little more depth is what should you do about it? It's not an accident that I started with Franklin Roosevelt. After he finished, uh, when he was dead, having only had a few months in his fourth term in 1945, it was a unanimous view of the United States that four terms was too long. And that was when they made the decision, the actual implementation came a bit later, that they would have a two-term limitation. You could have no more than two four-year terms. And the interesting thing is that both Truman and um, LBJ, Johnson, who, because they came in after the death of a president, could have argued that they were still under the eight-year rule, and therefore they could have had a presidency that went on into arguably a third term. Neither of them exercised it for a lot of reasons, and I won't claim this was by any means the only reason. But in Truman's case, I think it was almost the only reason. I think he felt that he had enough, and they'd had enough of him. Now, we look at the situation around the world. This country has taken a very prominent role for the last 30, 40 years in trying to persuade new presidents in independent countries, particularly in Africa, but particularly in the Commonwealth, to accept a two-term limitation on the period in which a, pres a president should exercise office. And here is the usual Great Britain uh, position. We argue for it to everybody else but ourselves. And the more I look at it, the more I think we have got to grapple with this issue ourselves. So last Thursday, prompted slightly by this uh, uh, conference, I will admit, I tabled a, early, uh, a, a private member's motion in the House of Lords to effectively limit the term you can be president for two five-year fixed parliament terms. Now, we had a fixed-term parliament introduced for the first time in British history in 2010. We now know that it'll be very difficult to take it away because it's legislation that's, you know, you won't be able to take away quickly. The Conservatives probably would like to take it away if they were to become a majority. Interestingly, Labour has committed itself to staying with a fixed term five years, even if they have a... Um, uh, overall majority. I think because they see the economic difficulties going on, and it's interesting that in the coalition talks in 2010, the person who upped the ante, if you like, from four to five was George Osborne, who by then had looked at the books and was worried about the long-term position. 
My own judgment is looking on this short experiment, but we did have coalition governments through most of the 1930s. My own view is that if you do go on with fixed term parliaments, which on balance I'm in favor of, like most things in politics, it's not easy, I would go from f down from five to four. And my bill is geared to what is there in the fixed term parliament. If you went down to four, then the limit would be eight. And that is what I'd much prefer. And effectively that would mean because no party is going to let their, uh, it run right to a general election. They're going to remove their leader, if need be, if they won't go earlier. So what you're really talking about is if you've got five-year fixed-term parliaments, that's 10 years on the law if this was to be passed, but it would really be nine years plus. You wouldn't stay the full 10. And if it was eight years, it would be seven years plus. On all the record, as you look at the two, uh, we've got four British candidates, in my judgment, for hubris syndrome, and looking at it historically. And I'm frankly objective about it because I have no English blood in me and I'm Welsh. And my hero is Lloyd George, and I think he did develop hubris syndrome, certainly by 1921. And the next candidate is Chamberlain. And I must say, if you have any doubt about that, read the letters that he sent to his sisters. Uh, and the way he praises his own conduct throughout these letters is quite extraordinary. And the third is Margaret Thatcher, who I don't personally think did have it all her life, although a lot of people will say you always did. And the other one, of course, is Blair. Now, if you look at all those things, these people are getting hubris syndrome on this only four, four cases earlier than eight years. But it's, because it gets worse, any limitation is better than nothing. And I took a pragmatic choice. If we're going to have five-year fixed terms, it's very difficult to go to the electorate and say, I'm fighting this election, but my term runs out in three years' time. It's continuous service or it's aggregate service. So Harold Wilson would be in court only just more or less was eight years. And I agree, actually, I don't think he ever had hubris. But if you are looking at this, it's not a perfect way of stopping it at all. There is still the traditional way, which is they got rid of. And all four of the ones who I think were got rid of. Lloyd George was got rid of by the famous 1922 committee. Uh, Chamberlain was got rid of after, really, the Norwegian campaign and when there was, in effect, a vote of no confidence, although it, it, he won it technically, and Churchill was put in by the Conservative Party. And the Margaret Thatcher was disowned by her own party in that vote of confidence when Heseltine stood against her and she saw the lighting on the wall and didn't stand. And Blair, despite endless presentation and things, was told in 2006, you've got to go within a year. Now, the other thing I would draw a little bit of attention to is how do you get at the minds of these people? And we've had a lot of discussion about words and what they say. Uh, Peter Garrett, who's here, has written a paper, Linguistic Biomarkers of Hubris Syndrome. And it's a fascinating uh, textual piece of examination in which they analyzed the parliamentary questions through the life of three quite long-serving prime ministers, Margaret Thatcher, uh, Blair, and John Major. And the result on this test of these hubristic words is overwhelmingly Blair, hubristic Thatcher, and no hubris at all, John Major, what you would all probably expect. What will happen to this legislation? Well, it won't be passed. But I think I might get a debate. Um, I might try a debate before May at the right moment. And uh, we'll see. And start the argument going. And I wouldn't at all object if, and indeed my objective is really, to not have it just discussing the prime minister's limitation, but also the limitation on the parliaments, as I say. And I'd like to come down to eight years for both. Now, the final thing is to say this. What about limitations in business? I've thought long and hard about this. People forget, but for the last 20 years, I've been a businessman sitting on boards and watching this in three different continents, Russia, England, and the United States. I think the best mechanism is that after five years, for any public company, there should be a law that there has to be an examination of the record of the chief executive with an external person and board members. One external person will change the way that this is done. 
It is not a criticism of a CEO who may be doing fantastically well for shareholders and everybody, and everybody considers a sex. It happens to everybody. If you make no exceptions, then it doesn't raise all the angst and the unrest within the company and the CEO getting frankly upset about it and his judgment. And then you look very carefully at this issue, and so that's the moment when you decide, are we going to go out to look for a uh, new person after a term of, say, six-year appointment. Otherwise, that six-year appointment or whatever length of time it's reviewed will never be objective. The uh, non-executives uh, are often very dependent on the chief executive for their appointment. And it would be, as far as I could see, the only mechanism that would possibly be acceptable. I would look to probably 10 years, 20 years, but take it get company law to change to do that. But best practice could be done and introduced much earlier.